Welcome, world, to another episode of Nobody's a Nobody podcast with me, Mike McVeigh. This is the podcast where I interview people I find absolutely fascinating, and I believe you will too if you give them a chance. This week, we are interviewing the interpreter, Benji Von Katz, and Jarvix's hot dog song of the week is Lately I've Been Thinking by Leody. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems like it's been too long to hear that bass open up this podcast, and I agree. It's literally been a year, um, if you count smaller months and whatnot. I have been in some weird places. Um, I've not had, like, depression or anything. I've um, just had a really rough transition. I did get into a, a better job that was able to support uh, me emotionally a lot more, and I have a great boss and great workers um, that I get to work with. Um, I loved all the people from my old job, but at the same time, um, it was just mentally taxing and making life very horrible um, for me. And I brought it home with me. It was my fault. I'm not taking it on anybody else. Um, but because of that, the Hot Dog Song of the Week by Leodi is actually from about two months ago. And I thank Jarvix and Leodi for not being too upset with me for waiting this long. But it's a beautiful song, and Jarvix has some thoughts, but those thoughts are from a couple months ago. Um so what have I been doing? What have I been spending so much time on that has been neglecting the podcast? Well, um, mostly improv. Um, I really, really enjoy Oklahoma City improv. I am learning more and more every day. It's uh, given me a new challenge. And to give, <laughs> I finally, my goal last year was to read 365 books. Um, and I read 370 and I hated it. It's the first time in my life that I actually hated reading books. And so I'm cutting it back tremendously this year. The maximum I'm hoping to read is 100, but my goal is only 50. Uh, mostly it's because I'm going to be concentrating on improv a lot more. I'll be taking some classes, um, and I'm <laughs> there's an improv manual. It's only a few hundred pages, like four or 500 pages. And I've already read it twice this year, and I'm working on my third time, and um, just really am trying to get some of the basics. And one of the reasons why I love improv is it teaches you teamwork. It teaches you teamwork in a way that... I have yet to find anywhere else outside of sports. Uh, the difference of sports is that generally if you don't have skill, you don't have a chance to play. You don't have a chance to get the reputa- repetitions in to play with others. And improv, it does. In fact, uh, that's what improv is. It's, it's learning from our mistakes and using those as a way to make a better situation. And it's very similar to real life. Currently, I'm enrolled in level three, um, and I'm also enrolled in our advanced short form. Advanced short form is going to be similar to like uh, whose line is it anyway type stuff, and it's it's a lot of fun. Um, my teacher's assistant for my first level class was Benji, um, our guest today, and he uh, was someone that I've really connected with. We've been able to share some thoughts, and um, <laughs> in fact, it, it took me almost four months to find out that he was a sign language, American Sign Language interpreter. And we talk about that. We talk about his uh, his improv experience, and we talk about making a movie in forty eight hours twice. Uh, there's a couple other things we talk about, but let's just jump right into it with Benji, the interpreter. How do you want people to think of you after you passed on? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think I would like people to think of me as uh a authentic person as a genuine person as a kind person um and as somebody that was perfectly well was content and accepted their own um that they were perfectly imperfect and an you know ongoing work in progress uh yeah i'd say yeah that about summarizes it Okay. So to go along with that, what kind of person are you wanting to be? I mean, obviously life is precious and, uh, and to be fair, you remember Amy from our, my level one, uh-huh. uh, my wife and I just bought funeral insurance or, uh, funeral preparation yesterday from her. Okay. Uh, okay. So, but I, I think about death all the time anyway. So that will be funny if that's where it ends up going, but so my mind might be a little bit more death focused than even normal. So, um, Though you could technically die tonight, and that would be a very sad thing, um, assuming that you have a few years at the minimum and a whole lot of years, somewhere between few and a lot of years, what kind of person would you like to end up being? Like, what are the, so when I, it's still the same question, but in your eyes, what's that kind of person? Who's Benji Von Katz? 
in 20 years, yeah. 50 years, however long until you um, leave this earth? Um, I would say uh, that, you know, similar to how I would like to be remembered, I suppose I would like to be thought of as a as a mindful person. I would like, well, yeah, I personally I, I continue and I think I'll always continue to be working on be being more mindful and just living in the present moment as much as possible. Um and I think that's one reason why I really enjoy improv so much because you can't do it well without being in the moment as fully as possible but as I've you know as I've gotten older I think especially over these last three years or so um I've sort of uh it's a what I hope I don't like labeling it a crisis I'd hope it was like a third life crisis hopefully it's not a midlife because then that would only put me at like 60 70 and that's sort of lame but uh just sort of I guess realizing taking a step back and thinking about realizing the extent to which I had um, the, the, the degree to which my identity was wrapped around certain labels and roles, whether that was, you know, what I do for work, um, uh, son, husband, um, you know, just go on down the list of all the labels people attach to themselves. And then, so I had allowed a lot of my identity to get wrapped up in that. And consequently, um, my self worth uh, as well, to a large extent, was dictated by each of those things. Um, but I really so be, being made aware of that, coming to terms with that, and then taking a step back and considering, well, you know, who who do you want to be? What's important to you? Um, what are the things that you've been uh, putting off pursuing that like what's stopping you so so who do you want to be uh i would like to be somebody that is um approachable a safe person well-rounded um yeah um i said i'll say it again you know i i, I really come through sort of this some sort self introspection and stuff realize I spent a lot of time either in the future or in the past where everything that's happening is happening right here right now and if I'm busy thinking about what I'm going to make for breakfast tomorrow or what I need to do I'm not paying attention to Mike I'm not paying attention to the podcast so um I'm a very I think of myself as a very creative person um I enjoy writing um drawing painting music that sort of thing I'd like to be thought of as a creative person, um, like to become a more creative person. And I find a lot of that creativity comes from being in the present moment. Um, and, you know, I, I, I saw something the other day, a meme that was a Weird Al Yankovic, and it listed all his accolades. And this isn't to say I want to be like, my goal is to become the next Weird Al, but it is, you know, uh, nine-time Grammy nominee, three double platinum albums, you know, this many, da, 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 and then below it is like uh, zero, you know, zero days spent in rehab, no domestic or sexual assault charges brought against him, you know, no, no scandals, like, I was like, oh, I mean, I, I, I like Weird Al, I think he, he's creative, but I had never thought about it like that, and I was like, wow, well, yeah, no, that, that is like, I guess the sort of legacy, the type of person I want to become. Right. Yeah. It's interesting to think about some of the cost of the choices we make. So when you talk about being creative and I would say at least for the past few hundred years, especially anybody that gets into an entertainment type thing, they use various types of crutches as a way to be able to be more expressive. And even in the improv community, we talked about this around the middle of December, where some people will drink a little bit before going on stage to try to loosen up, to get a little mm -hmm. bit free of inhibition. And one of the things I think, oh no, I don't think I know it was, it was in the UCB um, manual, because I just went through it again, and I'm working through it a third time already. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, they were talking about, it's a, sometimes you need the crutch to get started, but try to get to a place to not use the crutch anymore 
Mm-hmm. And then there's the other side of it saying, is it possible to get there without having ever started using the crutch? So, and I'm, I'm using vices. As, I like the word crutch yeah. a little bit better because vices makes me think that Don Johnson's going to come in with like a, some kind of pink color mm-hmm. turn. <laughs> white, white, white. Uh, yeah. Uh, right. Um, and I think that's actually a really good point that we don't think about sometimes in society. We, we get so focused on what we want to accomplish that we don't think about the negative trade-offs of what we don't necess- what might allow us to accomplish. I mean, I might be able to make a lot more money at the expense of denying my wife or daughter um, being a father or a husband, probably in the opposite. Mm-hmm. And so though that's, that's really kind of cool to think about that. And I do want to talk about your job later, but I want to get to that in a minute. Mm-hmm. I do consider you a very creative person. I do think you are fairly mindful. I mean, you're horrible at responding to text messages and <laughs> messenger. As multiple people have attested. In the- <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm too busy like- being mindful doing something else. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, <laughs> no, but, you know, no, it's... but that, but that, again, that goes back to you make a choice, and um, and uh-huh. in a sense, that's I've only gotten through two levels, but I I've been studying at a really high level of trying to really understand what improv is, and mm-hmm. I don't think it's much different than a lot of other areas. It's just that it allows for teamwork focus mm-hmm. a lot more than other areas, but improv is a lot about um, making choices, and then once you make that choice, to follow through. So. You've been in improv for how long now? Uh, I started in January of 2020. Okay. So I've got a tiny little window of what improv was like pre-pandemic, but not much. And you seem to risen pretty quickly, at least in the Oklahoma City community, because you've been involved with a few of the big narrative shows. In fact, even though I, I'm not super familiar with Bad Santa, you had the closing line and it'll make sense you can watch this on youtube people okc improv and you have a great line that just completely uh, wins you know it's the scene that it's a throwaway line in so many different ways but you were able to capture that and make something that was already really funny funnier um you've had the opportunity to help start a troop uh can't make can't shake this mid up Mm -hmm. and you've been a teacher assistant for a couple different classes so really in less than two years you've had a fairly involved thing despite the fact the pandemic has gone on all but two months mm-hmm. of your time what what how has improv and i know we haven't talked about some of the other parts of your life but what specifically mm-hmm. does improv do for you that makes you more bingy yeah um that's a good question um i think that like with so many other things in life whether it's a hobby or interest, career, you, know, you get out of it what you put into it. Um, and I, growing up, always you know really enjoyed stand-up comedy, which is not improv, but I've also really enjoyed improv, whose line is it anyway, Drew Carey, all of that. And because of a uh, less than idyllic childhood, I used humor as a survival mechanism um, and a way and a coping mechanism to help me get through some of the the more difficult times. Um, And I get a lot of like my my wit. I mean, my mom's a writer, um, dad's in construction, but he's very sharp witted. Um, And so all of those things, I feel like I had a natural uh, uh, proclivity or inclination toward what improv demands of those you know involved in it um so i think that gave me a bit of an advantage and then two i know you said we'll touch on this later um but my day job is a i'm a nationally certified sign language interpreter and within that particular language there is a significant and especially my job so much of improv surrounds around you know embodying characters listening, giving your full attention to what another person is saying, um, managing the flow of conversation between two parties and being that sort of intermediary that strat is straddling these two cultures and languages. Um, and I feel that there's a lot, a significant degree of overlap within improv is that you've got to listen, you've got to pay attention. Um, you're asked to personify, assume the role, the character of you know whatever it is you either 
endow yourself with, whether I come out on stage and I decide I'm going to, you know, be a, a, a cranky old uh, Italian man from the Bronx or, you know, putting all that on and em embodying that, you know, this w when it comes to American Sign Language, because you don't have the vocal inflection and intonation that changes the difference of a single sentence between I love you, Mike, or I love you, Mike, or <laughs> I love you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, so you have to co convey that with your facial expressions in American Sign Language. And so you become that character. There's role shifting to show that if I'm having a conversation and I'm saying da 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 da, -da and I'm Benji, and then Mike said, uh, excuse me? Like, uh, I've got to show that, excuse me, like, what did you just say on my face with the cocked head and the raised eyebrow? And it's a little exaggerated uh, compared to what spoken English users would convey in terms of affect, but there's right. some overlap there too. And I'd imagine that even though American Sign Language uses American English as its base, idioms are probably interesting to try to mm -hmm. explain and for those of us out there who don't know what an idiom is, will you explain that and what some of the problems are with trying to translate that? Yeah. Um, so idioms are little colloquial sayings that are particular to a that are particular to a specific culture or region, or so. Uh, um, letting the cat out of the bag, and it's used and it's used as a metaphor that's not taken literally. So letting the cat out of the bag, when I hear that as an interpreter, my mind goes to, okay, well, what did Mike mean when he said, man, why'd you let the cat out of the bag? Yeah, I won the $20 million scratch off lotto ticket. If I'm interpreting that, I, I don't literally say like verbatim, Mike said he let the cat out of the bag and then won the lotto because then the deaf person is going to be like, why does Mike keep pets and bags again? This seemed a little cruel, um, but it's like, oh, you, you, you know, you spilled the beans. You, another idiom, you, you let slip, you let something slip out that you weren't supposed to. And so I'm going for the meaning rather than all this other metaphor. And, so mentioning cat, of the cat out of the bag or spilling the beans, how would you translate that or what would the uh, what would the Ameri the english equivalent be to what you're signing um uh i would say that you know like you're supposed you know you're supposed to keep it secret and then you just went ahead and told everybody or you accidentally mentioned and then you know maybe you know slap my forehead like oh don't why did i do that you know to show that oh that wasn't intentional i didn't mean gotcha. to say that um and so that, and even something as simple as just, you know, palm on, you know, face palm, like, ah, I, whatever I just said, just signed. Now that's got that qualifier to it. It's like, oh no, he didn't mean to say that. That was supposed to be an inside the brain thought, not an outside the mouth thought. Right. Yeah. I guess if I was going to try to sign that right now, I'd get a picture of Patrick Stewart with his yeah, yeah, yeah. across his head. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ultimate yeah, face palm. You know, work a thousand words and good interpreters do that. And, you know, it, it goes both ways. Sometimes there's a, uh, uh, an English sentence that's, you know, 20 words long that I can convey the same idea in two or three signs. And sometimes the converse applies where, you know, this person just signed for 30 seconds and I can spit out in five what they just said and summarize it. Um, so it goes both ways. They both have their peculiar strengths and weaknesses, English and sign language. Yeah, I guess I've never really, I do. So in college, I did a lot of study on hermeneutics and hermeneutics for, I'll, I'll explain that one, is basically when somebody says something and they're saying it in a certain time period to a certain culture of people that you, to break down what they're really saying, you have to look at what is kind of the plain sense meeting, like just what we hear today. So cat out of the bag. Okay. Are we hearing the idiom or are we hearing somebody actually letting a cat out of the bag? Then we go back to the culture that they're speaking to because Russian culture or German culture, even today in 2022, 
is going to be a little bit different than American culture. And even that uh, Oklahoma city culture is different than Tulsa culture. Absolutely. And, and I know from friends who have been in the music scene, like they can, especially in hip hop, they can actually tell you where that artist is from just by the way the lyrics bounce, the way they, um, the catering, the catering, <laughs> the pacing catering. of the ly- cadence. Yes. The cadence and the pacing of the lyrics and stuff. Um, especially this was more popular back in the aughts when you had the dirty South, um, as a completely newer movement and stuff, but the difference between Florida, um, Houston and LA, there's a huge difference between those three, not even bringing in New York and some of the other places Mm -hmm. that come in. So yeah, I can, I can, uh, so I'm telling you (laughs) the hermeneutics of learning the culture and then learning the time. So uh, we always make fun of Shakespearean English uh, about how much different that is because it's a different time period. And whenever we try to explain it, we rarely say thou to the, thine own heart be true and stuff. We'll say mm-hmm. like, is this true to you, to who you are inside? Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll kind of translate that. So you're doing all these things at the same time, trying to figure out what the original meaning is or the closest to what the original meaning is of the person who is speaking or writing that out. And so mm-hmm you happen to do that at multiple levels for interpreting. And I I never even thought about how difficult an interpreter's job would be no matter whether they're doing sign language. And I don't want to dismiss sign language as being lower because we usually, when we think interpreter or when I think of interpreter, maybe I should say that I'm thinking of someone translating one language into another language. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, and I think it'd be a little bit more difficult with live, live interpretation, let alone you're using your hands. So Mm -hmm. you're definitely Mm -hmm. using a different part because, yeah, I'm just kind of going through this mentally. Some, <laughs> some... Yeah, like I, I think a, a good example of what you're talking about with the hermeneutics is if, you know, uh, I wrote a, a letter to my mom or and said, yeah, me and my cousin Vinny had a gay old time in Florida this weekend. And the date is 2022 versus 1922 totally different mental picture that gets conjured right um but you know you're you're right in that uh that there is a lot of moving pieces to it and it does take a significant amount of like cognitive um you know, brain power and that's redundant but um that's why if, if if a job usually lasts longer than about an hour and a half it's really best practice is to bring in two people to spell each other to help reduce fatigue mm. um, and take turns um, and just keep each other sharp. Um, right. And I, I get, and I'm not trying to get only into linguistics, but even saying gay old time, it's knowing who you are in your relationship with your mother, because you might say that sarcastically like, Oh yeah, we had a gay old time and you're purposely uh-huh, bringing uh-huh. up all the imagery. Um, and I, I guess I'm now thinking of like movies and TV shows where someone's, uh, you know, uh, Wayne's world, where um, she says this really long, or he says all these really things, but he only says like five words in uh, Mandarin. And <laughs> he's like, so, so, so. I don't, I don't, don't want to be offensive, but saying like five, <laughs> five quick words. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I already started it, but then it means like, and then they kind of wait for the subtitles to catch up for the rest of us. Uh-huh, and, uh-huh. Um, but there is some truth in that, that you, especially if idioms are used, but, or other certain phrases, certain concepts, you can't necessarily use verbatim lyric um, word to word. You have to use meaning instead of the other stuff. So that, that that's actually kind of cool. I mean, it's something we make fun of all the time in, in the TV world, but it's something mm-hmm. that comes across different. I can definitely see how improv can only strengthen that, or I guess that strengthens your improv. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, and you know, it was, it's interesting too. like sign language has been around for like millennia um there's i took a workshop recently they said they found some cave paintings down in mesoamerica central america that indicate your i think like two four two three four thousand bce like they were using sign language of some sort um and that unfo- while it is a language it was only recognized by other linguists as a bona fide language in and of itself I think in the 1970s like the mid 70s and prior to that it was just like oh that's just English on the hands it's it's like well you're not it's not really going from language as well like it's got its own grammar its own syntax it's you know, all of this stuff that's unique to it um, and it is 
yeah, it, it, there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I know for me and my degree program, uh, you know, I, I just have my, I have my associates of applied science and that's it. Um, and it was very uh, content heavy when it came in sign language and interpreting. Um, but it's not enough time to get the language, let alone to be fluent in it enough to be able to work. So a lot of people I graduated with aren't currently in the in the field just because they get out and they're like, ah, they, they just don't have the skills. Yeah, I can see. And I mean, college is not meant for practical use anyways, right? It's just to yeah. get a degree so that way people like you a little bit more. Um, <laughs> so I can definitely see yeah. something that's applied being not applied. Uh, mm -hmm. My degree is definitely not an applied degree. And I yeah. kind of regret that at times, though I'm thankful for the education. Yeah, yeah. The, and there really is, I, I could definitely talk about the um, interpreter sign language stuff for a while because I am very intrigued and we will have to have another conversation about this, yeah, whether it's absolutely. recorded or not, um, because there's so many different things about what it means for a language to be accepted. And then I know, I want to say it was the late eighties or early nineties, the news, I don't watch the news a lot, but this is one of the things that came on and it was a glove type thing that when you signed, it mm -hmm, would mm -hmm. sp kind of speak out, speak out in kind of a Siri voice of what the person's trying to say. Mm -hmm. And that's really cool, except for one major thing, because it makes the onus on the person who is already having a hard enough time to speak even more clearly or to be able to sign clearly enough for the glove to recognize it. So that way the people who are in positions and I, it sounds, I don't, I'm going to specifically say this word because I don't want to trigger people on other things, but to have positions of um, luxury or fortune of being able to not have to worry about yeah. um, doing multiple things just to communicate something simple. Yeah. That, and that seems to be the history of sign language from my perspective, looking in of how we're trying to make it easier for the non um, non sign language people, non ASL people uh -huh, to uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, be able to have to deal with those who use ASL as a primary language. And I, and I'm not saying that's limited to ASL. I think that definitely applies to Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. If you're down in like South Florida, Haitian culture, mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely, so this isn't just a specific language, but it, and it brings on a whole lot of like, seriously, I, my mind is now just blowing up with different connections of how we treat those who are not deemed as regular in society. And, um, and, I, and I've heard in a conversation uh, around that, around Christmas time that you had with a few other people that, um, yeah, I know we could go, we could go hours on that. Um. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I've definitely, there, there's, there's a lot of ways that I feel deaf culture, uh, which was something I was super skeptical about when I first heard about it. I'm like, deaf culture, like you guys live in America. How can it be that's like, okay, you don't listen to music that doesn't count as a separate, but they do have their own culture because they are cut off and they are an insular, you know, a very insular community. Um, but reframing things in such a way, there's a, a, a deaf guy here locally who made a really good point one day and it stuck with me. He's like, he says, when I go into a doctor's office or anytime I'm using an interpreter and I start to get some pushback on having it an interpreter there he's like um just i just want to make this clear this interpreter is here not for me it's for you i can't learn to hear you could learn sign language i'm not the one that's like and it just put a different uh it reframed and i was like you know that's right. a really good point and within the deaf culture there's a large amount of pride associated uh, with being deaf um, and a common uh, 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 phrase within the community is like, you know, deaf people can do anything but hear. And that's true. Like there are, there are professional deaf musicians, they're percussionists, and there, there's different levels of deafness, of hearing loss, but you've got deaf lawyers, deaf doctors, deaf pharmacists. It's like, there's no, the mode which in which they communicate is, not standard, normal, typical. 
but that's really the only thing that sets them apart. Other than that, it's not the same as if you had someone who was, say, um, a wheelchair user right. or, or blind, that sort of thing. Um, and even I know it's uh, with PC culture and everything else, you know, it's I common commonly hear people say, oh, well, yes, you know, we're here because we've, uh, we've got an interpreter here because someone's hearing impaired. There's some deaf people that take offense to that because the word impairs indicates, you know, denotes less than inferior. There's something broken. And they're like, no, I mean, yeah, my ears don't work. But other than that, like, I'm going to, I, sh I should have an equal seat at the table. Right. Um, and it's, it, that's something I was completely clueless to prior to getting into the field. And that actually brings up a whole other, um, not trying to use idioms here. I want to say can of worms, but a whole other subject matter that is difficult when describing something like as basic as possible and also not being offensive at the same time. And there's, and that, that is a cultural thing more or less. And yeah, I could, I could really enjoy this, but we're, we're going to move on. Not, All right. um, not because I don't want to, but. Well, uh, the last maybe, thing I'll say yeah, about yeah, that please. is that the, the preferred term that people within the community is deaf and hard of hearing. It was like, yeah, we're, you know, deaf or hard of hearing sign language users. Um, it becomes one of those, some people are real staunch about it and get real ticked off when you use the word hearing impaired. Others are like, eh, I'm not going to change the world. It, it just depends on the individual. Uh, but for those yeah. interested. No, and it's anything that is not accepted as normal, whatever that might be, all it does is it pains the people who are who do not qualify. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking, you're talking earlier about some of the things of who you're trying to become and who you want to be known for and stuff. It's, it's always kind of breaking out of that normal thing of being cookie cutter, but at the same time, somewhat accepted by enough people or enough groups that if you're not cookie cutter, you're not alone. Cause I, I do think, I don't think I'm alone that one of the biggest fears is being completely alone and not accepted for who you are. And, yeah. and there's no such thing as normal, but we still, you know, watch Dwayne the Rock Johnson and have weird crushes anyway, you know, <laughs> of like, well, that's the closest thing to perfection. Um, maybe a little bit more brains there, but you know, no one's perfect. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so in addition to improv, you mentioned a little bit about stand up comedy, but one of the things you did this past year that was really cool is that you participated and I want to, I'm going to mess this up, but I want to say it's like an eight day movie or a three day movie or something that you helped. Um, you were a cast member and I think you did some production stuff with them. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so it is a organization called the 48 hour film project. Um, and the way it's, it's been going on for years, it's an international organization. Um, and so they have hub cities where there's a local community, somebody in the local community agrees to be the point of contact and set things up logistically speaking. But the way it works is the premise is, is that all the directors that sign up and, you know, there's a, a small fee to be entered into it. Um, the directors that sign up um, all meet together on a Friday night, say at like six and they um, draw straws and each are assigned a genre. So um, romantic comedy, um, film war, uh, mm, a buddy film, a drama, comedy, you know, whatever. And then they're given a set of criteria that they all have to incorporate within each of those genres. So it's usually a line of dialogue, a prop, a character, uh, which can include that character's profession and name. So I had the opportunity to do a 48-hour film project here in Oklahoma City and also up in Chicago. Um, and for the one in Oklahoma City, the prompt was uh, the line of dialogue you had to incorporate was, I can't wait to see how this turns out. The prop was an apple. Uh, the, uh, the character's name was what was it it was a really cool name i i can't wait to try uh, to do that with multiple dutch. times it's dutch uh it was like oh no no that was van tendril van tendril was chicago anyways and then the, the a plumber and so 
each of the directors has to incorporate all of those into whatever genre they were assigned randomly. So that happens on Friday night at 6 p.m. You have to write the movie, shoot the movie, edit it, all the post-production stuff, and submit it by 6 p.m. on Sunday night. Wow. So uh, I was involved as a writer and then as one of the, as an actor in both projects. Um, And it was, I hadn't been involved in that type of production before. Uh, I, my only experience entertainment wise was really improv and then you know some stand up but uh it was a lot of fun but it definitely opened my eyes to just how much work goes on behind the scenes um and it was an awesome experience we actually got to shoot some of the Oklahoma City project at my house so uh I can say I live on a movie set now that is really cool and I got to see a picture of the movie uh we're not sure if that's available for us plebeians but uh is it available for us plebeians or is that something that's locked up in the vaults for 48 hour film oh no no no, no. um i've actually they're, they're both of those are available um on i think it's vimeo uh the producer uh david west was the guy i work with here in oklahoma city um he was the one he's got it on his vimeo channel and david west's old uh, classmate that from film school at OU was the one who invited us how we ended up going to Chicago um, and working with his buddy up there Ryan Lawson well that's really cool make sure to give me the links and I'll put that in the show yeah. notes uh, so that way I can see it if nothing else and if everybody mm-hmm. else can see it do you now do those get judged kind of like similar to cans or something or is it yeah the, 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 that's the other part so um, once all of the entries are submitted. There's a a screening that happens a week later and there is a panel of judges that have a, that there's a series of awards you can win um, like best of, like you've got the best film, you can runner up for best film, best writing, best acting, best use of character, best use of line of dialogue, da, 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 da. da. And so um, the, uh, the, Unfortunately, the I, I'm not sure about all the details. It became a bit of a dumpster fire for the Oklahoma City 48 Hour Film um, Awards, and what was supposed to come out in about a week or two ended up coming out like over a month, almost two months later. Uh, the whole community was super ticked because people like so no one gets paid for it, but still people got a lot invested in it. Um, and if you win Best of the City, so whoever so our film actually won all four categories we were nominated for. Oh, wow. Is, That's awesome. Yeah. Super, super proud well, of. You, you have to mention what you were nominated. Uh, for, we for were one. nominated for uh, best line of dialogue. Um, we were nominated for, I think, best character, best writing. And what was that last one? I need to look up and see still that's that's pretty amazing so you you were involved as at least two of those three if not all four of them yeah um part of the writing and delivering the lines and stuff so mm -hmm, were you the mm -hmm. best actor candidate um let me see you don't Um, know (laughs) it's been a while i've slept since then um i do so many amazing things i I just can't keep up with the awards difficult uh i mean paparazzi are just really relentless and at a certain point you're just like forget it uh i will look i'm gonna i'm looking that up on my phone and i'll find that but uh so yeah so the the we didn't win best of we didn't win oklahoma city like the title for best of oklahoma city the people who did win were absolutely phenomenal did a great job deserved it um so what happens is that the winner from each city goes to a national competition in washington dc and the best they pick like i think their top five selections uh and they actually get sent to the short film tent at Cannes. So, uh, oh, wow. That's yeah, really so awesome. It is. Um, so we're not making it that far, but it, uh, this year at least. 
this year at least. Um, so hopefully this year it's a little, the whole event's a little bit better managed and because I mean, so out of all those awards, there's also a, a fan favorite during the screening and you vote, there's, they pass out ballots. Don't know who won last year. Uh, that's a mystery, but. Um, as far as you know, you guys did. So I, until, until you hear differently. <laughs> my mom. Yeah, yeah. Battle of the Bands. Hey, we, we got the same amount of votes that hasn't been announced yet. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, have, I haven't seen anybody else lay tight claim to that title, so. So is that something that, so you said you can go to Chicago. Does that mean that there's a lot of people from outside of Oklahoma City that come into Oklahoma City to do it? Um, so it's interesting. It, it, uh, Pre-pandemic, I think it was a lot more geographically dependent. Uh, there's nothing that says, like, we couldn't have taken the same crew of people we worked with gone down and entered Dallas's 48 hour competition and walked away with a, a win, a best of down there. I don't, to my knowledge, that's not uh, something that they get that bogged down in. Um, but the one in Chicago, unfortunately, uh, I don't think we, did we get nominated? But I mean, we were up against stiff, com stiff competition. Like you had people there who were actively shooting lifetime movies uh, professionally um, and it's just we were small fish in a much bigger pond almost like in an ocean or something huh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> well that's still really cool is that something that you're hoping to do again next year or is this something that it's like a one-off um i am uh i really enjoyed it uh and it's something that i found um yeah, it was fulfilling. It was definitely, it was, I have no aspirations of becoming, you know, the next Paul Rudd, Seth Rogen, whatever, you know, whatever. But uh, I, I guess one of the neat things that I, I've got gained from improv, so many of the less, the, 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 the lessons or axioms, whatever you want to call that are in improv, I apply outside of that. And Yes, and is a, a very basic encapsulation of what is improv is, and that's just accepting whatever is just happening and then adding to it, not pushing back, um, and just continuing to uh, just like take the opportunity when it presents itself. So I did that with this, um, and I got I was surprised at the amount of positive um, feedback I got. Um, on my performance, given the fact I don't really have any professional training outside of um, Oklahoma City improv, um, I'd like to do. I'd definitely be interested in doing it again. Um, so we'll see. There's a it's it's a really neat time to be in the entertainment industry or even adjacent to it in Oklahoma City right now. There's so much going on. Um, Hey, OKC Improv, if you don't have anything better to do and you don't know if you can make it in the big time classes, the quotation big time classes, sign up for OKC Improv and you might get nominated for Best Actor in Oklahoma City. Yeah, so just saying. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> absolutely. And also might be a fan favorite if, depending on what the vote comes out to be sometime in the next yeah. uh, 20 years. So, uh, And I don't, you know, I heard it said that, and again, not having any frame of reference myself, but that when people are looking at resumes in the entertainment industry, that improv is a huge selling point because it speaks to your versatility and adaptability um, as an actor and the ability to think on your feet and just, and so I definitely, I, I work with great people, people that have been doing this a lot longer than I have. Um, and uh, I, uh, I surprised myself at my ability to get in there and actually like tread water and keep up with the big boys who have been doing this much longer. Well, I will say from someone who's been around entertainment for the past, well, definitely the past 25 years or so, not necessarily acting proper, but just entertainment as a whole, you do have um, a charisma that you apply enough confidence and energy behind it that it does come off well, what, no matter what you're performing or whatever you're doing. So I, I can definitely see that being true. Of you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of going back to what you were saying before about who, how I would like to be remembered, what sort of per, type of person that I'm striving to become. Um, and I guess to that, I'd add somebody that is like 
as I said, known for their mindfulness, their authenticity, but also known for like loving unconditionally. And unfortunately, uh, it was a big blind spot for me for a long time on how conditional the love that I extended to the people around me was. And it wasn't intentional and it wasn't malicious, but I took a, um, I took a really phenomenal, uh, I think it's about a six or eight week class um, up in Edmond uh, with a nonprofit organization I highly recommend called the Halo Project that specifically works with families that have a uh, that adopt or have foster children. But it was uh, an eight week, six eight week class called Making Sense of Your Past Worth. Um, and then they crossed the past out. So it's making sense of your worth. And there was one particular time we went in there um, that really had a profound impact on me. And I think we were, I don't, we were asked to, to the, the facilitator asked us, like, what does a, an infant do to earn your love, to earn being cared for? Um, looked after um, and it was me and a, it, you know it's they've got separated men's women's groups and the, I think there was about four or five other guys in there with me um, and we all paused and thought and like well I don't know I mean it's a baby like that's just what you do like and the faci facilitator said is like yeah so but think about it though it is like the antithesis of a good roommate, it doesn't contribute monetarily. It doesn't contribute emotion. It's a giant drain on time, resources, energy, the quality of sleep you get. You're poor, crankier, all this other. And for what? Like, what does it do to pull its weight? Nothing. And it's like, well, yeah, they are horrible roommates. He's like, but that's not the takeaway. He said, the takeaway is is that for at some point, and it it, it it's it at some point as we get older, that just existing, just being a human isn't enough to receive love and affection and affirmation and support. It's so, uh, what kind of grades did you get on that? Ah, C's, you're better than that, bud. Start. Or, you know, what school did you go to? What clothes are you wearing? Who your friends are? What neighborhood you live in? Uh, what kind of job you have, what kind of car you have, what house you live in, who you marry, and all this other just BS that gets stacked on top of there that, as I said before, I realized that had made up a significant amount of my identity and worth. Um, and the problem with that, because when I put all my eggs in this basket of, say, being an interpreter and I go for a weekend camping, get bit by a tick with Lyme disease and come back deaf myself, that totally destroys and shatters my own, like, I don't know how to function because I only function as an interpreter. Like, that's who I am. And if I'm not an interpreter, then who am I? I'm not valuable. I'm not worth anything. Da, 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 da. And he said, that's like, that's all BS, guys. Like, who you are. You, you, your, your worth is not dependent on your performance and your ability to do, accomplish, et cetera. Like you are a valuable person, inherently worthy of love and affection and un, you know, unconditional love and affection just because you are, because you exist. And yeah. people can, you know, say, oh, well, you know, and I've, I, I've experienced this, unfortunately, in the religious community I grew up in is that as soon as you stop being a good Christian, People start to wag their finger and say, hey, 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 no, no, no. And it's like, I'm pretty sure that book you guys like so much specifically says not to do that. So if you could stop swinging that rafter around, I'll help you with that straw in your eye. Um, and so it was, a, it was a big eye opener for me in both how I treat other people and also even more importantly, how I treat myself and the sort of self-talk that I engage in um, because uh, despite the charismatic, bubbly personality that is uh, out there for the world to see, I still, I've got a huge, a large amount of self-doubt, self-criticism. I'm my own worst you know, critic and we can all down the line. It's getting better. 
Um, but it takes time to unlearn those own old patterns of behavior. And I have to consistently make the conscious decision to remind myself to look in there and be like, oh, you know, you're Benji and you're worth loving, worth being a friend, uh, having in, you're worth having in someone's life just because you're you, not because you've got a PhD, or you make this much money, or you're a member of this club, etc. Oh, well, only if you respond to text messages in a timely fashion, will you truly get the love you so desire. Benji, thank you so much. You are loved, and you are a friend, and I'm very thankful that you're one of the people that I got to meet um, in the hopefully later stages of the pandemic. Yeah, uh, yeah, ideally. Well, well, we'll talk to you later, sir. Thank you so much, Mike. Love you too, buddy. Hey listeners, it's Jarvis again with my hot dog song of the week. Heads up, I've been feeling sad lately, so I've got a sad song today. It's by an artist I've been following for a while named Leoti. I was entranced a few years back when Leoti released a song called Karaoke. I placed it in my top 10 songs of the year for 2018, and I described Leoti's music as understated, plain-spoken, and authentic. At the time, I wasn't sure if Leoti was going to become a band or a solo project, and I'm not sure if Leoti knew either. With the isolation of the past couple of years, though, it's fitting that the project has grown sparser, both in members and in sound. Leoti has put out two new records this year, and both are full of atmospheric wistful sounds that meditate on heartbreak and unrequited love. The quirky, boyish vocals retain a sense of innocence. I feel like these songs would give me puppy dog eyes if their eyes weren't staring down at the floor all the time. The song I have today is called Lately I've Been Thinking, and it's from Leoti's new album called The Lion's Cub. It's about the regret of fruitless, fond memories, the kind of song that only ever mentions the word happy in the context of past tense. I've had my share of heartbreak, so while I'm presently in a content relationship, I can relate to these lyrics. Even more, the overarching mood fits mine so well of late. The way Leoti gets so close to the mic that you can feel the tenuous consonants in each syllable hits the spot for me. I don't feel very good right now. The world is a mess. My life feels like it could fall apart at the first sign of a storm. Sometimes I just want to curl up in bed, and I'm grateful to have music like this to help me feel less alone in those moments. Leoti provides that for me. Maybe Leoti can provide that for you, too. Here is Lately I've Been Thinking by Leoti.
thank you, Leodi, for what a beautiful song. Um, lately, I've been thinking, and Jarvix for recommending that. Uh, we appreciate you, the listener, for engaging, um, paying attention to these things, hopefully taking something with you. Thank you, Benji. It's always a pleasure talking to you, uh, especially now that you're responding to your text messages again. <sighs> Man, it's been a rough 22 months of the pandemic. Uh, world shut down and we've somehow found a way to survive um, sometimes it just feels like we've moved to a millimeter but you know what that's still better than we were yesterday no matter where you are no matter who you are no matter what's going on in your life you are loved and you are cared for and remember that nobody is a nobody and that means you until next time